Lecture 9, The Great Battles of Attrition. In this lecture, we'll be examining the great battles that dominated the Western Front from 1916 to 1917, already different in their character from the attacks that had marked the opening stages of the war in the West. In part, this was as a result of an evolution. Once the new and distinctive dynamics of industrial war had slowly been recognized, including the uh, inherent strength of the defensive side we've discussed in an earlier lecture due to the state of the technology of the time, there followed in 1916 to 1917 a series of huge battles of attrition that involved masses of men, some five million, in a hitherto unprecedented scale of battle on the Western Front. These battles were intended to grind down the enemy's side and to tip the balance towards victory. But ultimately, they too yielded little result beyond mass death and suffering. We'll examine in turn the months-long titanic battles of Verdun and Somme in 1916, and in 1917, the French Champagne Offensive and the British experience at the Third Battle of Ypres, also called Passchendaele. The lecture today will examine the guiding ideas behind the launching of these failed offensives and how the battles themselves could eventually take on a life of their own, actually escaping the initial premises of their planners. The battles increasingly came to be invested with a dogged, irrational national pride and took on enormous symbolic significance, which made it impossible to disengage at a time when it might have been rational to do so. We want to examine the commonalities, the shared features that marked the realities of these battles. Both the Allies in the West, the French and the British, and the Germans had planned decisive battles on the Western Front. These turned into disasters of attrition, which is a term that we need to actually define. Attrition means a slow grinding down or draining of the enemy's forces, a wearing down of the enemy side rather than the scoring of a decisive victory. And attrition was to be a phenomenon seen throughout total war as an experience. The mass battles that we'll be discussing in this lecture really, in a sense, had a logic of their own that soon slipped away from the rational control of the leaders, uh, revealing their lack of control of the events on the battlefield due both to uh, the lack of effective communications as well as their wrestling with the problem of how a battle of this nature should be fought. In addition, back on the home front, these battles became vivid symbols of national pride and assumed such significance that it was impossible to step away from them. These battles revealed again, or underlined uh, a phenomenon that we've spoken about in an earlier lecture, the strength of the defensive side. They also revealed the general's inability to understand how to employ new technology to break the stalemate. They eventually would be able to do so late in the war, but at this stage, the learning curve was still on its way up. It also revealed the growing callousness of many commanders towards the expenditure of lives. And it also revealed another phenomenon, which was, in psychological terms, also unexpected. The ability of ordinary soldiers to somehow keep on fighting and to endure these dreadful conditions. First, let's turn to the Battle of Verdun. This titanic battle between the Germans and the French in 1916 very vividly illustrated the futility and the destructive power of this new war. It was a lesson that unfortunately also was slow to be learned. This lesson was repeated at the Somme soon afterwards. Verdun has taken on enormous significance in the memory of Germans and French, and the events themselves were of a scale that was truly striking. The German general Falkenhayn, who had taken over from General von Moltke at the start of the war, had already started to rethink the approach towards the fighting of the war as a result of the disastrous first encounters of the first years. Falkenhayn thought in strategic terms that Britain was truly the decisive enemy. If France, the main ally of Britain, could be knocked out of the war, then Britain, in a sense, would have no choice but to make peace as well, and Germany would have won a decisive victory. 
His key challenge then was the question of how to, to knock France out of the war. And the answer that he arrived at was by grinding down the French manpower reserves. Falkenhayn's plans aimed, as he put it, to bleed the French army white. If they could be lured into a battle, the French would have to commit their reserves again and again, and eventually, by being drawn into a blood mill, would find themselves at some point without reinforcements and unable to continue the fight. To mark the decisive nature of uh, this battle that he hoped for, Falkenhayn named this operation in German, Gericht. The word means judgment. Operation Judgment focused on a historic fortress city in the disputed lands on the German and French border. This was the historic fortress city of Verdun, uh, a, a fortress complex that had first been established in the days of Louis XIV, the Sun King, but now had been built up into an enormous fortification to forestall a renewed German invasion, such as been seen in the Franco-Prussian War of the 1870s, and Verdun was considered to be uh, almost uh, untakeable, almost uh, uh, invulnerable to enemy attack. Verdun itself was surrounded by 19 forts of the most modern fortification, and dominating these other forts was a fort named Fort Duomont. It was precisely because of both the military as well as symbolic significance of this supposedly impregnable fortress complex that Falkenhayn chose to target Verdun above all. The entire point of this operation was to create a salient. The definition of a salient is a territory in a front line that juts out into enemy territory. That's to say, a, essentially a peninsula of uh, military territory that is confronted on three sides by enemy forces. The whole point thus, in other words, was to draw the French into a battle for the salient of Verdun, a salient that the Germans didn't even need to actually take. They could surround it almost entirely and then expect French defenders to keep pouring in in order to make sure that the salient was not taken. But Falkenhayn's observation that the point of this battle was not to capture Verdun, but instead to stage a massive battle on this spot, was on occasion either not understood or forgotten by German commanders and in some sense changed the character of the battle that he had at first planned. On the first day of the Battle of Verdun, on February 21st, 1916, a massive, huge uh, bombardment by German cannon began. German guns fired a million shells that first day, dropping 20 tons of shells per acre. The bombardments were enormous, it's estimated, uh, at least by one estimate, that some 60 million shells would fall on Verdun in the course of the entire battle. It was said that men could go mad under the impact of the long, long bombardments. And then German forces moved forward. On February 25th, German troops actually captured Fort Duomont in a striking and sudden raid. As Falkenhayn had planned and anticipated, the French felt that they could not sacrifice Verdun. Instead, they prepared for a dogged and determined national defense of this symbolically significant spot. The man who was brought in to command the French forces was General Philippe Pétain. Pétain was brought in to lead the defense effort, and he was in some sense the ideal man for this task. Because whereas so many other French military leaders had become devoted disciples of the cult of the offensive, Pétain was almost alone in emphasizing the importance of the defensive side and having thought through some of the aspects of a defense that truly could be effective. Pétain understood that this experience of the defense of Verdun would have to be handled in a way that maximally spared his soldiers. Pétain, for this purpose, set up a rotation system which moved troops through the battle, cycling them in and out, so that you would not have the same exhausted troops trying to hold the territory for weeks on end. It was estimated that soldiers would spend a maximum of two weeks in the what came to be called the hell of Verdun, 
And if they were able to look forward to the end of this time, they knew that at the end of that period, they would be cycled out and relief would finally come. It's estimated that some three quarters of the entire French army was rotated through this meat grinder of a battle, ensuring that many French soldiers had shared in the experience of the Battle of Verdun. From Paris itself, troops were moved out through the eastern railway station, the Gare de l'Est, which still, by the way, to this very day, bears under the name of the train station the destination name of Verdun, marking this symbolically significant battle uh, still held in memory. They would then be moved up to Verdun, and they would enter into its hellish experience. It was said afterwards that soldiers who moved away from the battle after having been relieved had a particular stare, a particular abstraction, a particular lost look in their eyes that allowed veterans of Verdun ever afterwards to identify one another even without words. The supply of Verdun, this salient, this uh, uh, peninsula of French territory, was ensured through a heroic effort that took place along the Sacred Road, as it was called. A thin road where 3,000 trucks rode in and rode out daily under constant fire, one every 14 seconds, in order to provide the military and food supplies necessary for the troops. Pétain, with his own firmness of character, rallied the French defenders, vowing in a famous phrase, they shall not pass. This battle itself, with its enormous expenditure of materiel and its horrific conditions, soon fragmented into many smaller encounters. And it was in one of these in March that the, uh, the young officer by the name of Charles de Gaulle, who later in World War II had become a leader of the French resistance, was captured by the Germans in this encounter. The battle itself seemed to lose coherence. No longer were there clear trench lines, but instead soldiers fought from foxholes or moved forward by jumping from bomb crater to bomb crater. In May of the year, Georges Robert Nivelle replaced Pétain in charge of Verdun and led the effort from there on in. The battle's high point was over after June of 1916. In part, the Somme offensive, which the British were spearheading at this point, opening in July, drew off German resources from Verdun and gave some relief. The battle itself, after months' duration, finally drew to a close in November of 1916, as the French very proudly recaptured the forts that they had lost to the Germans from October to December of 1916. And we might then ask, what was the outcome of this experience? Over 10 months of inconclusive combat, the casualties had been enormous. It's estimated, and the numbers are still debated and still not entirely clear to this very day, but we get at least a sense of magnitude. The casualties were 700,000 French and German casualties, nearly even. It's estimated that the French, and though this is a matter of debate as well, that the French casualties were slightly higher than those of the German side. Of these number of casualties, that's to say men wounded as well as dead, it's estimated that about 300,000, that's to say a third of a million nearly, were killed, which amounts statistically to about one death for every minute of the Battle of Verdun. The Battle of Verdun, which had been so carefully crafted and thought through at its inception at least by Falkenhayn, the German general, was arguably the only offensive of the war where the offensive side marginally uh, was, uh, took a smaller toll than the defensive side did. But in a larger sense, Falkenhayn's gamble had failed. He had succeeded in bleeding the French army white, and the French army indeed was exhausted as a result of this experience, but to a great extent so too was the German army in spite of its greater potential manpower reserves. The toll for the French had been enormous, and thus it's obvious why this battle remains a touchstone of French national identity and collective memory to this very day. About 10% of all of the French war dead were from the Battle of Verdun. And throughout the war as a whole, just summing up the, the entire losses that this implied, one out of every two Frenchmen 
of the age between 20 and 30 years, was killed, the loss of a generation. The French army's offensive capacities were shattered as a result of the experience of the defense of Verdun. And this experience, the failures of the, the battle uh, and the defense of Verdun initially, led to changes in military leadership positions in France, and the experience of Verdun also led to changes in military positions and leadership in Germany as well. On August 29th in 1916, in Germany, General Hindenburg, the hero of the fighting on the Eastern Front that we'll be talking about in a coming lecture, replaced Falkenhayn as the German commander-in-chief, bringing with him his talented quartermaster general, Erich Ludendorff. And we'll be speaking much more about these men who became war dictators of Germany uh, in the years that followed. In France, in December of 1916, General Nivelle, a new and confident officer, replaced Joffre as commander-in-chief of the army. In all of this experience, Pétain's reputation had soared. He came to be identified with a more humane and a more caring approach to the French soldiers who had made such sacrifices in the defense of Verdun, and he was elevated to the honored position of Marshal of France. There was a bitter irony yet in store in Pétain's own biography because this man who came to be a great national hero of the French in the war against the Germans later during World War II would head a collaborationist regime that cooperated with the Nazis, betraying the earlier national honors that he had been accorded. I'd like to say a word about the aftermath of the Battle of Verdun, because even those who visit Verdun today are still struck by the amazing traces that remain in the landscape itself testifying to the elemental force of this battle of materiel. Um, it's very difficult to describe in words. It's almost something one has to actually see to take aboard the landscape so many years afterwards of the battlefield, which remains to this very day still cratered and pockmarked uh, in really vivid and unnatural ways by the impact of shell explosions. And indeed, very many shells still lie not diffused, still active, many of them, in this poisoned landscape. An estimated 12 million of such unexploded shells still lies in the Verdun area. They're still being found, and hundreds of diffusers have died over the decades afterwards. Uh, parts of Verdun where uh, villages once stood were never rebuilt again, and trenches can still be seen in the area as well, along with tremendous and extensive graves and monuments to the battle. The Battle of Verdun also had other implications that carried on into the future. One of the French defenders of Verdun, André Maginot, later became France's uh, interwar minister of war in, uh, uh, between the world wars. Named after him was an extensive fortification line called the Maginot Line, which was intended to uh, make uh, much more determined and rational the sort of defense uh, that Maginot himself had lived through during Verdun, but the hopes that were vested in this fortification line were in vain, as Hitler's armies would eventually simply uh, uh, overcome this obstacle. Verdun remains to this very day a hallowed ground, with visitors and school groups traveling to this area, and indeed there are shrines that sum up its national and its uh, human significance, shrines like the famous Bayonet Trench and the legends that surround it that we'll be talking about towards the end of our course when we address how the war itself was memorialized. In quick succession, indeed before the Battle of Verdun had ended, the Battle of the Somme began. The Great Offensive on the Somme had been long planned as a joint Allied operation with the French and the British cooperating together in an assault on the German lines. The defense of Verdun ended up drawing off French forces that had been intended to be committed for the Battle of Verdun, and this left the British to take the lead. This was a case where earlier planning would play a fateful role, now that the reality had changed. The territory that had been chosen for the attack on the Somme was, in fact, chosen for a specific reason. It was an area where the British and the French could cooperate together. That was its attraction. That was the reason it had been chosen. 
In another sense, however, now that the French were increasingly not able to participate in the measure that earlier had been promised, this territory revealed itself as being in other ways quite unsuitable because the Germans held the strategic heights and thus the attack was, uh, in that sense, uh, not as efficient as it had been hoped for before. The British forces now took the lead under the command of Sir Douglas Haig. The first day opened with disaster. After an intense bombardment lasting five days of the German lines, which had been intended to cut the barbed wire and to destroy the machine gun emplacements and the bunkers of German defenders, British troops were sent forward on July 1st, 1916 against the German lines. The expectation of Haig and other commanders was that a breakthrough and a fast advance would follow once the lines had been broken. So British soldiers often carried about 70 pounds of equipment, slowing their progress as they moved forward against the German lines. The chalky ground of this area had allowed the Germans, in fact, to dig far deeper fortifications and bunkers than might otherwise have been the case. And machine gunners, who had simply been uh, lying in relative safety in these deep bunkers, now emerged to mow down the British as they moved forward in long lines. On that first day of the Battle of the Somme, there were 60,000 British casualties, 20,000 of them dead immediately. This was the greatest loss in one day of any army during the First World War. And four months of such battle continued. Further assaults also failed, including uh, a quixotic cavalry charge, which soon broke down in the cratered ground and before the German guns. British tanks were put into use as well on September 15th, 1916, but they weren't there in sufficient numbers to really create a decisive result. Overall, by November of 1916, the British forces had won about seven miles at the cost of 400,000 British casualties. Throughout the battle as a whole, over one million casualties were counted for the British, French, and the Germans. Sir Douglas Haig's reputation was battered by this battle. Uh, He's remained an intensely controversial figure ever since. And soldiers referred to the Somme in particular as Haig's great foul-up. More bitter soldiers tended to use a stronger word, also starting with F, for the great foul-up. The next battle that we turn our attention to came in the spring of 1917, the offensive on the Champagne. General Nivelle had planned a great French-led offensive combining force and massive attack, and he promised great and immediate results that were to follow. However, German countermeasures complicated the planned offensive. In some sense, uh, German uh, tactical thinking in this regard uh, got in ahead of the Allied military planning. General Ludendorff strengthened the German trench lines and started a systematic and quiet withdrawal of German forces about, on the average, 25 miles back from the line that they had been occupying uh, at this point, back to a systematically prepared and far better fortified line of defenses, about 25 miles back, called the Siegfried Line by the Germans after a a German mythic uh, hero uh, of uh, of the sagas, Uh, The Allies called this the Hindenburg Line in February and March of 1917. Uh, This was not a retreat out of weakness. It was rather a strategic withdrawal to far better uh, fortified and held positions. In the process, the Germans subjected the areas that they were about to give up to what is called scorched earth policies, leaving them entirely devastated so they could be of no use to the Allies and so that their advance would be hampered, leaving essentially a desert of destroyed villages, poisoned wells, exploded bridges, and destroyed roads. And in the process, they deported some hundred thousand civilians. Nonetheless, in spite of this unexpected withdrawal of the Germans, the Nivelle Offensive began with the Battle of Arras on April 9, 1917. Vimy Ridge was taken by Canadian troops, and the battle seemed to start well in this regard. But the French attack in the Champagne region was a disaster which paradoxically was was worsened by the extravagant expectations that Nivelle had created of finally achieving, by mass and violence of approach, 
a breakthrough at long last. As a result of these disappointments, in late April, mutinies broke out among the French troops. Ordinary French soldiers refused to move up to the front and refused to attack. They protested what they saw as the meaningless sacrifice of their lives for nothing. And they used a very interesting phrase to describe what it was that they were doing. They called themselves strikers, men who were striking in protest as how the war was being conducted. And we're going to speak a lot more in a coming lecture when we talk about dissent about these mutinies because they're re very revealing, in fact, of the sentiments of ordinary soldiers who had endured so long, had endured the Battle of Verdun, had endured other encounters, but now, finally, as they put it, were going on strike. General Nivelle, whose reputation was destroyed by these failures, was replaced as commander-in-chief by General Pétain, the hero of Verdun, who had vowed that the Germans would not pass on May 15, 1917. Pétain now used some of the charisma, some of, some of the image that had been built up around him as a result of the defense of Verdun to restore order. Uh, he did so by a combination of severe discipline on occasion, as well as the assurance that policies would change and that French soldiers would not be sent to their deaths uselessly in renewed offensives of this variety. An order was restored. The mutinies and the military strike were put down. But nonetheless, very revealingly, it was clear that the French army's offensive capacity in order to mount huge offensives of the sort that had been att uh, attempted finally was spent. The last of the titanic battles that we'd like to consider under the category of the great battles of attrition is the third battle of Ypres, the very name, the third battle, suggests just how much some of this ground was fought over again and again and again, that's known, uh, especially to the British, uh, by the evocative name of Passchendaele after a village uh, that uh, featured prominently in this battle. In late July of 1917, General Haig, even after the failures uh, of earlier offensive, offensives, now launched another British offensive in Flanders, the third battle of Ypres. The hopes uh, for the battle were heightened by the use of unprecedented uh, technolo technological uh, intensity uh, in uh, an event that was really quite striking. This was the quite deliberate and careful and slow mining of a strategic area that the Germans had held, the so-called Messine Ridge. British troops had undermined this ridge, which was a strategically significant location, and had packed it full of explosives, uh, a million tons in fact, uh, in order to prepare for a surprise explosion, a blowing up of this ridge in order to inaugurate uh, the attack. And this explosion of Messine Ridge took place on June 7th, 1917. Uh, the explosion was of such intensity that it was felt in London, uh, far, far away. Uh, but the results of this initial breakthrough yielded only about two miles advance. And this turned out to be, while nonetheless a, a, a good omen uh, of the possibility of breaking through, uh, not nearly what had been hoped for as a result. In some sense, military planners themselves had been deceived by their maps. The maps, it's been argued by military historians, deceptively showed promising positions, but what was neglected was the quality of the ground which would prove to be very wet and muddy. And in fact, seas of mud uh, are especially symbolic of the entire experience of Passchendaele. Now, that's not how General Haig saw it at first. He had high hopes of breaking through into open Belgian territory, punching through the German lines, reaching the port of Ostend, and beginning uh, a, an advance into Germany itself. The attack began on July 31st, 1917, and rains that rained down in this period quickly turned the ground into, quite literally, oceans of mud and wet. Tanks that were sent forward quite literally sank into this mud uh, and disappeared. The last attacks of this drawn-out battle took place on November 6, 1917, and they at last reached the village of Passchendaele. The result of this battle was a British gain of five miles. Some staff officers who had been involved in the planning of the battle itself 
later bitterly repented the entire venture, which had cost the British 325,000 casualties. Uh, There's one anecdote in particular that to me sums up in a very bitter way uh, the regret uh, and the, the the illusions, the lack of understanding that some of these officers had shown. One of Haig's subordinates went to the front to see the battlefield after, in quotation marks, the British victory. He went to the front and seeing the mud that trapped his car as they drove forward into the areas that had been fought over, he actually, with amazement, looked out over the muddy landscape and broke into tears and exclaimed, Good God, did we really send men forward to fight in that? The outcomes of these battles were ambiguous. What was clear was that they were synonymous with the senseless mass death of the Great War. And the search for other ways of breaking the deadlock, the stalemate, would continue, whether through technology, the opening of other fronts, gaining of other allies, or subverting the enemy in other ways. The fighting on other fronts we'll consider in our next lectures.